Welcome back to All Kings Considered. I'm Dan Casey, and once again, we're here to bring you the best roast that Westeros has to offer. This week's hot D was a royal affair full of conspiracies, cruelty, and horny nobles cutting a rug on the dance floor. But before we cut in and bust a move straight into spoiler country, let me introduce the rest of our small council. First up, she is an actress, a host, a dungeon master extraordinaire, and a musician. Her new album, Behold Her Dreams, is available now wherever fine music is streamed. Please welcome back Amy Vorpal. Hi! Amy! Good to be here. I am so happy to have you back. How are you doing? Oh my gosh, I'm doing great. You know, I, I caught all the shiny poke. I, I got 13 shiny Pokemon yesterday, so... Um, that's ver very many for those of you who don't know. It was a community day. This is so. strictly a Digimon house, so I'm going to have to ask you to keep that, <laughs> that kind of language. That cannot for be any, true. For any, of our, for any of our listeners out there who were offended by what Amy just said, we're so sorry. Digimon, digital monsters, Digimon are the champions. Pokemon, take a hike. Um, oh, Amy. wow. Yeah, yeah I'm so sorry. Pokemon, no. Uh, Amy, I have an important question for you. If okay. you were a knight of the seven realms with a cool-ass nickname, what would your nickname be? It would be it would be um, the thrice magic, and Ooh. that's in reference to uh, a little tidbit about myself that has recently leaked to the internet that I have <laughs> dated on. three I have dated three magicians in my time. <laughs> so thrice magic it is. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> they just kept crawling out of the same DM. <laughs> that's right, exactly. Yeah, there's just there's I look I, I have a hat and uh, men come out of it and. And they're the magicians, as it turns out. But so am wow. I. <laughs> <laughs> I. I do not want to find out what else is in that hat, especially if the rules of a bag of holding apply. Um, <laughs> so we'll save that for later on. Uh, because we also have to introduce, once again, our Nerdist staff writer, Joffrey Lonmouth's defense attorney and the only maester not in on the conspiracy, Michael Walsh. Hi, Dan. Hi, Amy. Glad to be here, as always. Mikey, I have a very important question for you. I feel like this episode was uh, pivotal for you because I really think this might be the one that turned your opinion of Kristen Cole around. Would you agree with that statement? I would not agree with that statement. It did not oh. turn anything around. If anything, I am even more on the path towards absolute hatred for this man. Oh, man. <laughs> well, huge bummer for anyone who thought that uh, Kristen Cole would get redeemed in Mikey's eyes this episode, but we'll get into that in just a moment. In fact, we're going to break this episode down for you in just a moment, but to do that, guess what, folks? We have to spoil what happens in episode five of Hot D. And as always, book spoilers, if you're worried about that sort of thing, we're going to avoid them, but if you haven't seen it yet or you just live life too carefully, well, leave now before you start horsing around and see something that you probably shouldn't. <laughs> All right, folks, let's get into it, shall we? So I want to know, what were your overall impressions of this episode? Because for me, it, it might have been the best of the season. It was just so well done. Amy, I want to start with you. What were your thoughts about this episode? Well, I mean, I haven't been able to talk about the entire season either. And so I want to say that, too. So I am loving the show so much. And I guess the main the main reason I like it is that it's followable, <laughs> um, where <laughs> like I did... I did read the books before seeing Game of Thrones, but even as I'm watching it, it felt like um, I had to do homework afterwards, which wasn't um, it wasn't it wasn't homework I didn't want to do. It just did feel a little bit like wow. I mean, they're they're putting a lot into this, and this follows you know maybe there are some like extra storylines, but technically it's just one storyline, the Targaryens. So in this episode, uh, I felt the same way. It was just like a lot of a lot of good meaty, juicy stuff, uh, a lot of story being told, a lot of character developments. And at the same time, I was able to follow it. And I didn't have to, you know, read a novel about, you know, what the hell was going on. Yeah, definitely fewer flashcards per capita required for <laughs> House of the That's Dragon, right. I would say. The, the only way they do, kind of... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No. Please. Oh, I was going to say, I watch it with subtitles on, which is a trick yes. I learned from Game of Thrones, because the spelling and the pronunciation and, and just knowing how it's written for the names is like very helpful for me. Well, most Targaryens, uh, they're allotted like the same eight letters at birth and then they have to add like slight modifications here and there. <laughs> they and they shook the boggle, they put it down and every name has to come from that one boggle. It's yeah. hidden in the mace. Cloister. Their neural network needs a lot more training so they can get into other names beyond the same seven they use. Um, but <laughs> with that said, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I definitely find it's uh, as easy to follow as Game of Thrones because uh, it definitely it definitely focuses on fewer 
main players, but mm -hmm. a lot of those main players are also very similarly named. Uh, but Mikey, what about you? What were your thoughts on this episode? What worked about Game of Thrones and what's working about House of the Dragon is the way that it combines political intrigue with action. You know, you get these interpersonal relationships that are just layered with meaning and every single action and decision has huge ramifications. This episode had all of it, as we usually get when there's a wedding in Westeros. You know, we get <laughs> all of these people, we get all of these people into a room and everything that goes with it. And then somebody named Joffrey dies and it's entertaining, you know, so I don't, I don't know if how many more Joffreys are left in the realm, but I'm hoping we can find a reason to invite them to every event going forward. They're the red shirts. <laughs> there's a strict one in one out policy. Um, so anytime one dies, another one's instantly reborn somewhere else. Um, it's the only way that reincarnation works outside the Dondarians. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, you know, it's gonna be a good episode when there's a wedding involved. Uh, I'm just curious. Is there? They don't. They don't. There's no like color appellation for this one because we had the we've had the red wedding, we've had the purple wedding on Game of Thrones. Uh, what what color would we give this? Uh, maybe not a color. I might call it the meatball wedding because that's what Sir Joffrey oh, Longman like. I uh, I thought that when we got you know they did the flash cut away from the rock uh, with uh, when Damon was about to kill his wife, they did the flash cut away, and I was like. Okay, thank thank goodness we're not going to see just like an abject bludgeoning of a head, and then we're at the end of the episode, and I'm like, oh! <laughs> they were saving it. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely uh, Chekhov's blunt force head trauma, where they like, <laughs> oh, I bet that'll come into play later, and it clearly did. it did, because oh my god, it's uh, you know it wouldn't be Game of Thrones without some like really just messed up hamburger meat ass deaths involved, and. Uh, yeah, Sir Kristen really went for the gusto. Um, now, I want to talk about sort of the timeline of this episode. You know, they, while we've been doing a lot of time skipping in the series so far, this actually was almost a reverse where it condensed a lot of storytelling from other, like, like a longer period of time in the books into a very short amount of time in one episode. Um, now, Mikey, I know that you had thoughts about this. So what were your thoughts on how they condensed what was like a three-year period? Is that correct? Yeah, they took events and not only did they condense them, they put them out of order. Um, Lady Rhea in Fire and Blood, she doesn't die until a year after the wedding. Um, Sir Joffrey Lonmouth doesn't die at a rehearsal dinner. He dies. So what happens is there's a there's all these activities for the wedding. There's attorney. There's always attorney. Mm -hmm. And Sir Kristen Cole hits him with his mace and really injures him. And he died. Jo Joffrey Lonmouth dies six days later. Uh, it's not this brutal blatant murder in front of everyone it's the way that everybody in westeros can get away with murder when they just harm somebody during a tourney and go Oops. right everyone, everyone kind of knows what's going on but they can't prove yeah. anything um, so this was this was both big picture and small picture really condensed and it's the first time the show kind of went from giving us the true story to adapting the book for a tv show and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it worked. I think we just got a really, really good episode with a lot of important stuff happening. And as we've talked about in the past, Dan, the best moments sometimes are spurred up by years. That that works in a book. It doesn't necessarily work on a TV show. So mm -hmm. I think it's all good. I think it's all good stuff going on. Yeah, I, I think this is the halfway point for season one, and they needed a a sea change to set like sort of set things off for the second half of the season, or in this case, a hot D change. And they definitely gave us that. Um, and I'm really excited to see what they can do from there because, you know, I, I don't I don't feel like I missed any of that rich detail because you know I, I love George R. R. Martin, but sometimes he can get a little lost in the sauce. And I think for an adaptation like this, I think it was, worked worked really well, kind of the way they intercut these different storylines and then just really compact their courtship because you know we've had enough sort of beating around the bush uh, with. Okay, Rhaenyra, you have to do your courtly duty and you have to marry this person that you probably don't want to. I think they did a really good job about sort of setting the stakes and then seeing how that plays out and then sort of lighting a powder keg and having part of it go off. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I'm excited how they handled that. But Amy, what were your thoughts on this? Well, I guess my thoughts were in 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 my own brain. I hadn't you know dived into this lore in a very long time, so it didn't skip. Like to me, I was like. Yay! Like I was just happy. I, I, I there was stuff happening, and I was watching a TV show. So I didn't clock that that the time jumps had happened. It was only after reading some articles that I was like, "Oh shoot! Yeah, this is a, a lot of storytelling 
um, that they're compacting. But, you know, the trip, the trip overseas, the, the courtship, the wedding, I mean, in, in, I guess in my silly little storyteller brain, you're just like, well, yeah, of course, there's a courtship. And then immediately there's a wedding. <laughs> um, but, but I guess like in hindsight, you're like, oh, yeah, that probably took a lot of time. Um, but the other the other part of it that was that made it feel not disjointed was for me, there was one moment and it was it was when Otto is leaving and talks to and talks to his daughter, the queen. And that was like I mean, he had just gotten fired or like let go last episode. So to me, that kind of just like somehow linked it all together where it was like this this is concurrent, you know. So, uh, yeah, that that just it just felt very streamlined. Well, that's, I think that's the best kind of adaptation where you don't kind of notice the artifice and you don't really notice the what's been airlifted and like seamlessly blended in elsewhere. Like uh, unless you've been like revisiting it recently or you're just paying yeah. attention, you know, if you can get lost in the reality of the world, I think that's a testament to what they're doing here. Um, but let's talk about, uh, you brought up their trip overseas. So let's talk about the Fast and the Furious Tokyo Driftmark, <laughs> a.k.a. Amy the Valerians. I want to talk I know, about that was this. Another, that was another one where I was like, well... Of course, they just made a sea voyage in two minutes. No problem. And then Otto is just now leaving. He took his time to just leave the castle. That's fine. <laughs> Look, as many as many pedantic fans pointed out in Game of Thrones, I believe it was season seven. Yes. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. They apparently have speedboats in Westeros because <laughs> uh, remember how quickly Varys and Daenerys got around. So That's same right. technology. It was just lost for a couple of years, but yes. they got to drift mark pretty quick, but it's okay because I don't mind because they've established time jumps. But what were your thoughts on the family's uh, big trip to Driftmark and High Tide to uh, pursue this courtship? We get courtly politics. We get sexual politics. Who do you think emerged on top in every sense of the word? Mikey, let's start with you. You know, he's pushing his luck. He is really, really coming up to the edge of going too far with Viserys. But you oh, got like, Yeah, you got to like what Sir Corliss Valerian pulled off here. I mean, that's, that's a blatant snub. And, you know, we saw Lord Strong, the Hand of the King, righteously upset. Like, what mm -hmm. is this? What is this? Where is he? The king is here at his home. And then we see him pushing, you know, for this legacy of well, what's going to happen with their names. You know, who's going to – is it going to be – is your, their kids going to be Valerians or Targaryens? And, you know, he kind of realizes that afterwards, like, I might have I pushed a little too far. And this is kind of the thing that we saw back when – at the beginning of the show when Damon is like, these people don't protect you. You know, you have all of these people that you trust and listen to, and I'm your brother, and you don't trust in, in, in me, and I'm the only one who would protect you. And we kind of see that happening here. Um, but we also saw that Corliss is married to the smartest person in the realm, uh, the person who would have been the best ruler of Westeros, who recognizes like, hey, this isn't, you're worried about names. I'm worried about our son, who we just put right in the path of peril. You know, and this is this is why Rainey's is, I think, maybe so far my favorite character, just in terms of like admiration. Like, wow, she is smart. She gets it in a way nobody else does. And it makes what we know in terms of the story that's coming. And I don't even mean spoilers. I mean, we know that there's a war of secession coming. It makes everything that's going to happen when you look at what could have been and what we could have avoided had they chosen her. It makes it that much sadder. Yeah, it, she definitely feels like the clearest eyed person in the Seven Kingdoms. Like everyone else is like, oh, I don't know if the people are going to go for this. But she's like, no, not only that, but there will be a civil war and mm -hmm. our son will be directly in the uh, target of all of these angry nobles. Yeah, I definitely think that she acquits herself well. I really like that they included that scene of uh, Corliss afterwards being like, did I make an oopsie doopsie? <laughs> did I go too far? <laughs> Apologies to anyone from the UK. Um, uh, Steve Tucson, I, he's doing a phenomenal job as Corliss. I will stay. I will say, still one of my favorite characters. I, I just love a, a nice seafarer, and I hope we get to see more of him uh, at some point if they do that sea snake spinoff, like maybe him telling tales of his youth. Uh, but Amy, what were your thoughts on this uh, royal trip down to Driftmark? Well, first of all, with Corliss and and the Valerians, they're. So you have to, so they asked all the right questions, you know, like those are my questions. Like, all right, so hypothetically, we have a kid, what's going to happen? You know, like that's, that's the stuff you just want to know. So it's on screen and it's, it's like, as far as I'm concerned, it's binding contract because it's on the screen. <laughs> um, but the other thing is because in Game of Thrones, you do have to ask yourself, okay, what if this person dies real soon? You know, so that's, that's when you say, okay, well, what if Rhaenyra's 
and uh, what's the guy's name? Lane. Lanor. Lanor. Um, they get married. They have a kid. He's a Valerian. Um, he, uh, Rhaenyra dies. Then he gets promoted to king. And yes, all it's supposed to be that he's a Targaryen, but the last person who would kind of hold that accountable is now dead. So he gets just kind of promoted, and now he's he is a Valerian. So kind of, I don't know. <laughs> I was doing well, the math in my head, and the Valerian name might be on the throne. Easily. It, I, w- would the throne transfer to him? I thought it would then. It would. Oh, I yeah, thought it would then be. go to the next Targaryen in the line because the next oh, he's the just- king. He's the king consort. He's not been named heir to the throne. And then it would shift to their firstborn their firstborn heir, regardless of gender. No, no, uh, I'm saying if they had an heir. Oh, if so they, they if they so if, if they, they have an heir, heir they're born Valerian. But yes. then when they ascend to the throne, they will be retitled and I'm uh, saying, Steve who's Targaryen. Enforce that? And who and I'm saying who would enforce that? Because Renair oh, prob- is dead. Oh, if Renair is you dead. See, do you see where I'm Yeah, going? I mean, there's there's probably maesters. Uh, I'm sure there's other Targaryens that might be like, ahem. Okay, well, let's say they're dead too. Then, it, what, let's say there's no one. <laughs> okay, so anyway, in, the, in this fantasy. I think the fantasy, Valerians are doing great. <laughs> in, in this world where all the Targaryens have died and only Valerians remain, I could see that being the case. But <laughs> don't, underestimate, don't underestimate the power of a name. You know, yes. being, being named new King Targaryen is much more powerful and carries much more influence than if you were named King Valerian. Yeah. In fact, and I think, I think if you go oh, back, I guess it, that's true. I think if you go back, you know, they changed the show, changed the, the grant, the great council of one one they changed it to uh, princess Rhiannis being the second one, you know, came down to her and Viserys. That actually isn't how it happens in the books. She is passed over years earlier. Um, and he, Viserys is actually chosen over Laner Valerian. And I've always believed that part of the reason why was because one of them had the Targaryen name and one of them didn't. So, yeah, I, it's it's definitely a fun what if. Uh, you know, who's who's going to be around to enforce it, especially if it's a dragon rider. But I, I think there would be great value in taking on the name Targaryen for any king or queen. You know, it's just like Viserys said, a dragon will rule on the throne for the next hundred years, the same way they ruled for the last hundred years. Corlys definitely kind of overstepped his bounds there, but kind of realized like, okay, I think I got everything I'm going to get. But I also want to talk about the other big conversation that happened there, and that was the beachside chat where they came to a special understanding with Rhaenyra and Laenor. Uh, Amy, what were your thoughts about this? That is, that was Shit's Creek. That was the wine conversation in Shit's Creek. Do you like red wine? I like white wine. I like both of them. You know, and it was it's like I wonder how many iterations of this this conversation we're gonna see over the course of um, j- just uh, entertainment before someone's just like, y'all, I'm queer, and it's like, all right, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think I think that's why. I guess this is. I just noticed in this episode, Rhaenyra is smiling more, more smiles per screen time than I've seen in a mm-hmm. long time. And I think it's, I think that's the reason she's like, okay, cool. Like, I don't know. I mean, obviously she's getting kind of exactly what she wants as, as far as she's concerned. So she's smiling a lot. <laughs> she's just yeah, got like the future of her sexual journey is, is bright. It is nice to see uh, that these are two people that clearly understand each other. They understand they have a duty to the realm, and, but they're also like, Hey, just because we have to get married doesn't mean that we can't uh, continue living our lives and be happy in our own ways. And yeah, I, I thought it was one of the more like one of the least fraught uh, deal making uh, like conversations in, on the show so far. Everything else is kind of like underpinned by a one person is kind of getting screwed over. Um, but Mikey, what were your thoughts on this encounter? Well, I think there are two things, one pertaining to the show itself. There are no secrets. It does not matter how personal it is. It does not matter how much you try to hide something. Everything gets out. Everybody knows everything. And, you know, we saw that in another scene. I'm sure we're going to talk about later. That was very important. But that, you know, there is, it's so blatant and how much everybody can see through, you know, what's really going on that it makes you wonder why anybody does anything. You know, why, <laughs> why anybody in power doesn't just sit at home and do the whatever the Westerosi equivalent of watching TV and reading books, just staying to themselves. I wonder why does anybody do anything, right? The yes. other, and this this is coming from the the books, you know, the Fire and Blood, the the primary sources that the history is written from. They're not generally kind to Rhaenyra. 
they definitely paint her in a less than glowing light. And one of the ways they did that is when they tell the story about when she marries Lenor, she says something kind of snide, like, I think he'd be happier marrying one of my brothers. And it definitely kind of presents it that his sexuality is a problem. It's something that she, she, you know, makes fun of and diminishes. But here we see like, she's pretty good. She's a pretty nice person. She's like, listen, I get it. It's a matter of taste. Why, why, this doesn't have to be a problem. If anything, it's great for both of us. Let's do this thing that our families want us to do. Let's do this thing that we both kind of know is good for us. And then let's also live our lives without judgment. And it's it's a nice moment for her and for him uh, that lasts all of three seconds, you know, before everything goes to hell. But, you know, it's nice. It's about as long a time of happiness any couple gets in Westeros. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice that they made Rhaenyra an ally, but she's also in need of allies herself. And uh, speaking of things going to hell, let's talk about her and Sir Kristen on the boat, uh, where uh, instead instead of sailing away, he incels away. <laughs> oh. I, that's not fair to say that is he got spurned for obvious reasons, and you know, he had <laughs> ideas about one thing. I, I apologize. I apologize no, to Sir no. Kristen on, on that count. Only on that count. Only on that specific <laughs> yeah, yeah. misrepresentation. Uh, look, it was uh, clearly they, they were misaligned on what the relationship actually was. Uh, uh, it, I will say, I will say as far as Sir Kristen, that was, that whole moment was so cringy and like in a good way. It was like obviously good, for, I guess good for the character. That character is a little dicey to me. He's like kind of all over the place, the way they, they've written him where he's, you know, noble and then not so noble. And now, now he's very into being the white cloak and now he's very into marrying Rhaenyra and so he's he's a little he's a little all over the place um and and I guess I I guess I could understand it because he is so close to the the throne and her and and I guess he cares about her I don't know that, that was one plot line and, and kind of little relationship that seems a little bit rushed especially when he's jumping to you know let's let's run away together that, that it just it was just cringy and, and it made me go, oh, poor guy, stop, stop, you know? Yeah, I think that was one spot where uh, the time jumps uh, didn't really do the show favors. You didn't really get the sense. Like, obviously, you get the sense the relationship is a little frayed, but it seems like they're on reasonably good terms there. And, you know, it definitely, you know, sort of the day after it felt like very awkward on the show uh, previously. So I was a little curious how that was playing out. But there's also that like kind of power imbalance there where she is the heir to the Iron Throne and he has broken his sacred vow. And like, this is the only thing that he had. And you know, later on, when he talks to Alicent, he's like, I understand that um, you could geld me and, uh, and have me murdered. But instead, I just ask or you could geld me and like have me tortured. But instead, I ask that you just kill me outright and spare me the torture. So he's like, this is this feels like life or death for him. And this feels like his only way out. But he just he doesn't acquit himself particularly well. Um, but Mikey, what, what did you think about this as his number one super fan TM? I couldn't wait for the show to answer what, what I think is the biggest question from Fire and Blood. There are two different accounts of this moment. One says that Rhaenyra asked him to run away with her. The other says Kristen Cole asked her to run away with him. I always believed it was Cole asking her. It's a big reason I always hated him and, and will until my last breath. But what- Wait, wait, what, why does that make you hate him? Oh, oh yeah, don't worry, don't worry. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go here, let's go. I, I feel like I'm <laughs> about to be fed a, a delicious okay. treat. <laughs> it always seemed like wh whomever, whoever asked the other to run away, it always came from a place of love. That's how the history is presented. But this scene gave me even more of a reason to hate him. It was not out of love. It was out of self-preservation. He regrets the decisions he has made. He has brought dishonor on himself. She did not force him to do anything he did not want to do. And now he is asking her, give up everything. Give up your family, your home, your titles, and your future crown so that I can feel a little bit better about myself. It is so selfish. It's not even a good request like it always read, which is he just fell in love with her, right? This, how many stories do we know, right? The knight who falls in love with the princess and she gives it all up and they run away and live happily ever after, right? He, it wasn't even a fairy tale that he wanted. He wanted a, a mulligan. He wanted to get out of feeling bad about himself. It's absolutely despicable for him to ask the future of Westeros to run off to Essos so that they can, you know, eat some oranges on a ship yeah. 
right? It's yeah. despicable Yeah, the enough. painting of the picture wasn't, he, he didn't put a lot of time into the poetry of it. <laughs> <laughs> for him to do it, for him to do it, not out of love, but out of selfishness is even worse. I don't know how anybody walks away from that scene feeling bad for him. And quite honestly, I don't know how anybody could be happy with Queen Allison not torturing him and gelding him, which would be too kind yeah. for him. Well, I know, but disagree because because it is setting up like like that's the first thought, and then the second thought, as you see, is like it is setting up this like e extra relationship where Allison finally like takes the helm and is starting to play the game herself, and including like including with uh, Sir Kristen Cole. So and, so yeah, maybe she should turn her. Yeah. Why does Go that ahead. happen? Because he feels so much self pity and guilt that he confesses to something he hasn't been accused of. Yeah. In that moment, in that moment, right? He's supposed to love Rhaenyra so much, they're going to run away together. But in that moment, it's so much about him and him alone that he confesses to something that nobody accused him of doing. He has no thoughts for her and what this revelation will mean. Is zero concern for Rhaenyra. He is the worst. Sir Kristen the worst. Well, let, let's talk about, like, I, I was going to talk about Viserys next, but since we mentioned Alicent, let's sort of proceed into her arc because she becomes, like, ascendant this episode. She has so many huge moments, you know, starting with her in the Godswood with Lara Strong. She kind of, it feels like she's starting to understand the game, the Game of Thrones in a way that she hadn't previously. And, you know, we'll, we'll get we'll get to her and uh, Sir Kristen again in just a moment. But let's talk about her and Laris Strong. I love Laris. I love uh, seeing him here. What like a smooth operator he is. But even even as like slick as he tries to be, Allison's like, what do you want? I know I know you're like, stop talking in riddles. I know you're trying to tell me something. But what is it? So what were your thoughts on that encounter in the Godswood, Amy? Well, I I loved it because it does it does remind me of the spider from Game of Thrones and and all of that. It, but it, it I mean it, I think that's like the second beat of Alice of Alicent's kind of awakening of like oh I'm I'm a queen you know um, <laughs> I gotta I gotta do something. Oh, you nailed her sound effect. <laughs> I mean I I did as I was watching the episode I was like. I might need an acting class on clocking things, you know, like there, there, <laughs> like someone says something and then she does it and Viserys does it. I've seen her like they all, they're all like, oh, you know, like the beautiful <laughs> mind, like I understand mm -hmm. now, but like you see math floating in front of her face. <laughs> But it is, I mean, it's well done. Like the, I'm, I'm not, this is like a, a, I mean, they're very good at it and it is very fun to watch them clock things. Um, but the first beat I would say like is auto going, uh, you made the wrong choice. I got to go. You're on your own. But n next time it's up to you to make the right choice. And then she's given more fodder as to what the right choice might be because everyone's going, um, Rhaenyra's a, a dang liar. And she's like, she's my best friend. And so this one is finally like, wait, Rhaenyra might be lying to me. And, and so that interaction, I, I'm, I'm actually interested to see where this, all of the strongs come in because now they're, they're getting real into the inner nucleus of this, of this Targaryen family at the moment. So I, I, I really liked that scene. Yeah, and he, he, I think the comparisons to uh, the spider are very apt, not just because they're off by one letter apiece, um, with <laughs> yeah, Varys and Laris, but yes. no, he's Oh my God, I just... almost called him Viserys. That's why I said the spider, because I was like, wait, I think I forgot his name, but no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Where it's it just an, another expert at stirring the pot with just a, an offhand comment being like, oh, it's pretty crazy that uh, your best friend's lying to you about her secret uh, tea ceremony late at night from the Grand Maester. Well, and it's to Mikey's point, too, that it's like, well, oh, did it happen? Yeah, someone saw it, you know, like the, the Grand Maester bringing tea. Who saw it? It doesn't matter. We all just believe that someone did. And now this person, this Laris man, has that information and can yeah. deliver it. I, I, I believed him implicitly, and now I'm furious with Rhaenyra as well. Uh, but Mikey, what were your thoughts on Alicent's overall arc this episode? Combined with the opening scene with her father, where he kind of lays it out like, you're smarter than this. You know, you chose Rhaenyra over your own family, and look what happens. Then she finds out her father just got sent away for telling the truth, a truth that Rhaenyra swore on her mother was false. And we see what happens, like you said, Dan, she, she realizes she's playing the Game of Thrones. She didn't necessarily want to, but it's impossible not to. She is in a spot. She's got 
family pulling her in one direction. She's got her husband pulling her in another. And there is only one thing she can do, which is to kind of stand up for herself, which she quite literally does by entering that feast late and, and making this huge appearance. I mean, you know, it wasn't just the, the showing up in the green. It was cutting the king off and making everybody stand up for her. Like, the, it, this is really her announcing, I'm not just his wife. I'm the queen. And don't you forget it. And don't you forget where I come from either, every single one of you. And I thought it was incredible from a storytelling standpoint, the way they had Damon interrupt him first and you have no one standing and it's just everyone is just sort of like, you were exiled. Why are you here? And then Viserys folds like a chair and has a chair brought over for Damon. It's just like, yeah, uh, I guess join join the feast. But the the second one with Alice and arriving in the green was just like absolute mic drop moment. Um, and what's the, what's the significance? I, we we touch on this in the show. They mention the the what it means when they shine a, a green beacon in High Tower. But what's the greater significance of her arriving specifically in green during this wedding? Yeah, uh, sir, I really enjoyed that moment, <laughs> Sir Laris. Uh, not Sir, where Laris Clubfoot says to his brother, like. Hey, do you know what color they light the 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 tower when they're calling their bannermen to war? And his brother Sir Harwin's like, "Uh, let me guess, it's green." It's just a great moment, a way to get some needed exposition and also give great characterization to the two. It's just a simple exchange. But if for those who don't know, the the high towers are lords of Old Town. Old Town is the oldest city, probably the oldest city in Westeros. It dates back to the First Men. It was where the High Septon used to be out of before King's Landing. It's where the citadel is, which is something very important that I'm sure we'll discuss later. So they have their castle is called the High Tower. It's where they get their name. It's not only a castle; it's a, it's a, a oh my god, I'm blanking. But, you know, it's a, a beacon. Citadel, you know, it's a beacon. yeah, yeah. And uh, so you know, it's always got the flame going. But when it's time to go to war, the flame is green. It's it's their it's their calling card. Let's go. So her her walking out there, you know, I don't think everyone in that room would have got it. I think that there are definitely some people who are like, oh, that's a nice dress. But the, the smartest people who are going to play the biggest role, they're the ones who would know exactly. Because you know, we saw her wear blue, the same blue dress, I think, 500 times. So the people in that room who know what it means know this is, this is basically a declaration of war. Like, this is really getting ugly now. Yeah, and just the the way that it just brings everything to a screeching halt, and then the icy stepdaughter, like it's just so oh, well yeah. done. She clocked it. She for sure clocked it. Look at those face clocks. Happening. Yes, <laughs> look at those face clocks, indeed. Amy, <laughs> what, what, what what were your thoughts on the royal wedding? What was your favorite moment in this scene full of so many moments? Oh yeah, um, I didn't know. So I there were so many things where I was like, oh shoot, where is this going? So. Um, Lainira, Lena, 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 Lena talking to Damon was mm -hmm. one. Um, Joffrey talking to Kristen was another, and and then Damon talk, and then Damon trying to I guess make out again with uh, Rhaenyra. But and then at the at the at the full front of it all, it's just like this whole season is painting Viserys as like the least informed person ever. Like he's he's so cute. And doddering, and he just he just doesn't belong on the throne. Like there's he's, just so yeah. He's just trying to eat his chicken. He's, he's just yeah, trying to eat some and, birds. And get, get his get his daughter married and have some like hot sex and have you know like <laughs> there. But but he's not like he's not trying to do anything you know. And it's just like Jesus. Everyone around him is trying to do so at the at the culmination of like the nosebleed after he's like coughing and wheezing and napping the entire episode. I don't know. I guess. I guess if I had to pick a favorite, it would. It would actually be the Kristen and Joffrey conversation because, of course, Joffrey has clocked all of the exchange of glances, <laughs> and he's like, oh, "I know what's happening," and and he just he just doesn't he doesn't approach Chris, Sir Kristen in the exact right way that Sir Kristen Sir Kristen is doubling down on his his uh, not not nobility in the sense of um, his his. Uh, like name, but it, the nobility is as far as I'm noble and I'm honorable. And he's trying to double down on that. And, and Joffrey's over here going, guess what I know, you know, and it's just, I, I think that what, that's what prompts him to, um, you know, pummel him. Yeah. Just a, a really catastrophic, uh, misread by Joffrey in terms yeah. of, you know, <laughs> ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Yeah. It, it's just, 
I truly like if he had just kind of left it at that first mention, he would still be alive right now. Yeah, uh, like I, I we're both believe. noble. We both need protection. I got you, bro. But instead, he's like, "We're both a little naughty, aren't we?" <laughs> Sir Kristen's like, just nope. keeps <laughs> twisting the conversational knife. And no, granted, an an incredibly uh, unwarranted overreaction by Sir Kristen Cole there, <laughs> uh, just ruining the yeah. wedding, and then can't. It seems like they cancel the rest of the week's activities afterwards and just have the wedding immediately. Um, yeah, I just I, I just can't believe that. What, what do you think? What do you think about the ramifications of Sir Kristen's big outburst? Because also during that scene, it was it was gen, the way they shot it very well done. It was very scary because you see Rhaenyra almost get crushed in the throng of the crowd, and he's supposed to be her sworn protector. She's in more danger than ever. None of the other white cloaks or anyone are there to rescue her. And it's that really scary moment for Viserys where he's like, I can't see my daughter. She's gone. And it reminded me a bit of how Jon Snow, you see him sort of like almost drowning in bodies during the Battle of the Bastards. Um, but what were, what were your thoughts on his big outburst and just sort of how they choreographed that melee, this sort of like precursor to the Dance of the Dragons, Mikey? Well, it led to a perfect moment where <laughs> the hand of the King Lord Strong just looks at his son and goes, and Harwin Breakbones. Uh -huh. you know, now we've seen where he gets his name from. I mean, that guy just goes in and he clears house. He's knocking guys out with one punch and he picks her up and he carries her off. And it's just so good. You know, it's just it's just one of those things where you're like, oh, that's right. The writing, the writing on the show has been phenomenal. And the way that they let action speak, uh, I, I, I could watch that clip a hundred times and not get bored of it. You know, the, the stuff with Joffrey Lawnmouth, the dumbest person who ever lived, apparently. <laughs> go up and threaten a member of the King's Guard with a. I'm the Prince of Kisses. What does that mean? Do you think? <laughs> <laughs> he should know what that means. His his house's sigil is the, the house uh, lawnmouth sigil is skulls in in red lips. So he's really stupid. He's really really dumb. Uh, I don't think he deserved to have his face mashed in, but I'm not totally surprised it happened either. I guess I guess I am because you don't expect a King's Guard to just brutally murder someone in front of yeah. witnesses. Uh, what I will say is, as Viserys, you know, try to explain, like, perception is truth. He's also the king. Whatever story they want to tell is going to be the story, you know, which was uh, my I, I don't know. I have not seen the next episode. So if I'm right, please don't accuse me of spoiling something. You know, my bet is will be something like he saw Sir Joffrey take out a knife that he was going to kill, you know, Damon mm -hmm. or Rhaenyra or somebody. Um, so that'll be the way out of it. It doesn't change what Sir Kristen Cole did. He's a he's a murderer. He's a horrible, yeah. horrible murderer. A terrible. But he has murderer. the queen's protection now. He has the queen's protection because that's, that's enough. That's yeah. Enough. He, he's he's like her trump card because he has the he has the dirt on Rhaenyra and uh, he, you know, definitely he, now she has leverage on him as well because mm -hmm. uh, he is in her debt because he will not be gelded or summarily executed. He's going to be like brought into her fold it seems which is it's it's definitely like a, a, a juicy development on the drama front there and then, well, her just, fold didn't didn't exist even before this episode there was no fold it's like you know numero one into my fold is Kristen, and then we're moving i mean then it does look like the uh the old town people you know will stand with you like it, it sounds yes. like gathering but it didn't exist before literally that, that wedding and, yeah sorry go ahead right. I was going to say, this is also a great example, and we've seen this before. If you have information on somebody, don't point blank tell them you have information. Ned Stark goes to Cersei. I know the truth about your kids. Ned's dead a few days later, right? Joffrey Lonmouth, I know your secret. He's dead immediately. But we saw with Laris Clubfoot, just let them know you might know something. You know, plausible deniability can keep you safe. And that's why I think for everything that happened, that might be the single most intriguing scene in this entire episode. Mm. People have already, you know, you don't have to know the history, the full story of what's going to happen to see that this is a guy, you know, who can handle himself in the royal court. He's smart. And I think what we saw in that scene, you know, he's not dead. <laughs> he's not mm -hmm. dead. He knows the secret about the princess. He doesn't go to Rainier and say, I know you got the moon tea. He goes to the queen and says, oh, well, I guess she's not sick. That's great news. And I think what we saw there and I can't wait to talk about him more as the show goes on. He's juggling a lot of balls right now in the air because he, I think as much as Otto Hightower's convinced war is coming, 
Laris is preparing for the coming war. And now he has sort of, you know, you would think, oh, his father is the hand of the king of Viserys, who's named Rhaenyra heir. Why isn't he loyal to her and to the king? Because he doesn't know who's going to end up on that throne. Mm-hmm. And he wants to be able to say at the end of it, well, my father served your father. Well, mm-hmm. I gave you this information you needed. And it's, it's, it's always fun to see the smartest characters being really smart. You know, like the way Varys was before he decided to start plotting against Daenerys on the open beach. Well, look, everyone <laughs> has a lapse in judgment from time to time. Uh, you, know, if you have one bowl of the brown too many, it addles your brain. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. It's definitely nice to see this sort of power player emerge and just sort of, you know, the power of dropping some breadcrumbs rather than uh, spilling the entire pot of chili like Kevin on The Office. Um, and Laris is Lionel's son. That's right. Correct. And Lionel is now the new hand of the king. Yes. And and Harwin is also Harwin Harwin, the- Harwin and La- Harwin and Laris are Lionel's sons. And so okay, so all three of those strongs they're they're about to get some they're about to get some storylines, right? <laughs> I, I would say it's fair to say they will become increasingly important as the show continues. I think that's uh, definitely a fair statement without giving anything away. Cool. Um, but yeah, I want I also want to talk about uh, I don't know if he's the, he's definitely not the smartest person in the realm, but he's certainly one of the most interesting. And that is uh, Damon. Uh, He's my favorite. Look, he's uh, an abjectly horrible person, but uh, he's also eminently watchable. Like Matt Smith, when he walks on screen, you're like, I know some shit's about to go down, uh, but I need to know what exactly happened because I know you did something absolutely wild. Yeah. Uh, And, you know, how this episode starts and like, the way he uh, summarily shows up back to the Vale to murder his wife and who's apparently a marriage that he never consummated, but now no one can prove or disprove that. Uh, And then at the end, the gall to be like, oh yeah, it was horrible. What happened to her? (laughs) Also, I'm going to take your castle. That moment where he's talking to uh, Ray Royce's cousin was just brutal. Uh, So I want to know what were your thoughts on Damon this episode? Oh, David's a little mischievous imp, and I, I just really, I, 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 he's, he's like the main reason I'm watching the show because there, there's lineage and there's um, rules and bureaucracy, la 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 la, and then there's the wild card, and it is just, it's just so fun because he's, he's definitely not Tyrion level of knowledge, and you know, like Laris is very similar to Varys. I would say that there's, there's some Tyrion machinations going on with Damon, but but he's worse. He's like not as smart. He also is like extremely narcissistic and, and uh, very transparent with what he's going after. That being said, um, uh, this, this episode was dope because you got to see him. I mean, this is where the time jump it's like, okay, first he's there. Now he's here. Okay, fine. Who cares? He can be wherever the hell he wants, I guess. And he, yeah. So, so time jumping is fine, especially for Damon. So he gets to, he gets to the wedding and and it's just like you're still not done dude you know like and then and then lay lay gosh lena lena, lena approaches yeah. him and she's going to make a play which he doesn't seem that unreceptive to and so so he he's i think he's going to be okay you know you just always get the sense of like oh god like Viserys, like he should have i don't know he should have done something because cuz damon's going to damon's going to rock everything i and i loved his conversation uh, with renera and how he was just p- positioning himself to make sure that everyone thought that whatever the rumor was might be true oh just such a and she was kind of into it which was it kind of it's a, a proud family tradition for the targaryens yeah, yeah, the, they're uh, very uh, close family nieces. many yeah. uncle nieces yeah yes uh mikey what were your thoughts on uh damon this episode it, damon targaryen should be on every show just a chaos agent. Literally yeah. every show on TV would be improved if Damon Targaryen just showed up every week being like, chaos. Let's just go. Let's, I don't care. I don't From care. my perspective, he looked at a horse and the horse <laughs> reared back and died. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the most interesting changes uh, from the books, which is in the books, Lady Rhea falls off her horse. She is in bed for days and then she gets up thinking she's okay. And as soon as she gets up, she drops dead which would imply that he does not kill her 
in the books, you know, because she would have been able to speak. And if you rewatch the scene, I watched it many times to make sure I got it right. He doesn't actually do anything when the horse falls. She panics because she's pretty sure he's going to kill her. Mm -hmm. That causes the horse to panic. And then, you know, he's walking away. He's leaving her and she can't leave well enough alone. I mean, you want to talk about bad decisions. Don't. Don't. What are you you doing? What are you doing? You know, he's you know, he's not right. You know, he's not a good person. Let it go. So, yeah, yeah, Damon Targaryen. No notes. Continue to be. (laughs) Yeah, that I think that was one of the most brutal and savvy changes, I think, for the show. It definitely adds a layer of unpredictability and menace to his storyline. Um but I, well, I but want to make sure had, we have time. It still had his um, his character going. Uh, why not? Sure, I guess I'll kill you. You know, it wasn't yeah, just sure. this calculated. Like I'm going to do this. It was like he has a good suggestion, honestly. <laughs> you know? And then and then later he's like, you know what? Actually, I think I'm entitled to your castle. So uh, oh, that was yeah. Who who great. goes up and accuses a dragon lord of of murder that you can't prove? Like people just think it through. Just go live your life quietly. Just. Think it through. Do not, do not accuse the crazy man with the dragon. Well, <laughs> that, it would be a boring show if they didn't accuse him of the, of wacky things. Um, but I want to, I want to talk about while we still have time. I want to talk about Viserys because, man, this guy, poor, poor Patty Considine. He has the roughest go of it this episode, from uh, like blowing chunks on uh, the ship to random nosebleeds to falling over multiple times. Uh, He's in really rough shape. You know, you have that moment where Rainus clocks his missing fingers. And, you know, I really think this also really plays into what we we're talking about with the Grand Maester conspiracy um, on the when we talked about it last week. Uh, but, Mikey, what, what do you think about this? You know, we have all these comments about Otto Hightower being like Viserys isn't going to live to old age. Um, do you think this is just him sort of clocking that the king is in not great shape? Or do you think that this is because he's in on it with the Maesters? This episode, I think more than anything that we've ever seen on Game of Thrones or House of the Dragons, really makes it look like there is a Grand Maester conspiracy. And for those who who don't remember what that is, it says that the Maesters, right? Maesters go to the Citadel, they earn their chains, they get sent off to castles and keeps, and they are loyal to the lords and ladies of that keep. The Grand Maester conspiracy says that's not true, that they're secretly working together, that they are sharing all of these secrets with one another, and that they really only serve their order. The other part of this, and this is not a spoiler if you watch Game of Thrones, we know at some point dragons are going to disappear from the world. We know that Daenerys brings them back. The other part of this conspiracy is that Grand Maesters are the ones who got rid of dragons. Grand Maesters, Maesters in general, right? They are men of science, of knowledge, of order, of control. And dragons are the complete opposite. Dragons are, are magic chaos death bringers. So if you if you were looking at it, and by the way, for those who haven't read the George R. R. Martin's novels, this theory that the Maesters are in it for themselves does not come from readers. It comes from characters in the books, including an Archmaester. So there are two characters who just come up with this theory, being like, this is what the Maesters did, and one of them is an Archmaester himself. <laughs> you see this episode opens with Otto being like, the king is not going to live long, followed by Viserys falling apart like he's made of paper mache, like what is happening, and when you combine that with the, the shoddy treatment he is getting from the Grand Maester, which we even see, you know, an underling, the Archmaester Orwile, Orwile, mm-hmm. new here, just going to say pay attention, Orwile is, is trying to give him better care. It, it, it's impossible not to look at all of this and say, is something going on? And I, I know it's your favorite, Dan. I know you can't get enough of the rats in – in George R. R. Martin's novels, one of the characters who raises this conspiracy calls the Maesters gray rats. And every time one of them shows up now, all I'm going to be thinking is like, that does look like a Maester if a Maester was a rat. Yeah. So, so Mikey, are you saying that the grand conspiracy, like they're all conspiring together for sure. And, and the great conspiracy that they're conspiring together to do is to, like the end game is to wipe out the dragons. Uh, I don't want to get too far into that. Just the, just the fact oh. that we know the dragons eventually. I just don't want to. I want to make sure I'm avoiding spoilers. But oh, okay. what is important? What is, no, no, it's it's a it's the, it's the best question to ask. I just don't want to answer it. Okay, fair uh, enough. What's really really important to the show when it comes to this conspiracy is where the Maesters come from. They come from Old Town, where House High Tower rules. So if you're a Maester and you want to control. Westeros. You want to make sure that 
you are creating the world that you like, you now have a chance to put a high tower on the Iron Throne. If there was ever a time for the Maesters to put in some grand plan, now would be it because they are they are protected and they are close to House Hightower. Mm. And that is really, that's a really fascinating part of this theory that this show is raising is were the Maesters looking at this as the best opportunity they ever had to, they don't even need to wipe out House Targaryen. They just need to have someone that they can influence and, and, take some sort of control over. Yeah, it's it definitely uh, Otto's comments uh, and that sequence between the Grand Maester and Orwile are, are two of the big moments in the season so far that really made me think like, I think they might be onto something here. I, I'm becoming uh, Maester pilled by the day. Uh, I definitely <laughs> think that I definitely think that these guys are up to something and uh, they did not take any sort of Hippocratic oath uh, in Westeros. Um, and yes, I do love that we're watching House of the Departed uh, with all of these rats appearing constantly. <laughs> if we see a third one, I will lose my mind because you can't just keep showing us this like, check out this symbolic animal. Uh, it loses its power every time you use it. Uh, but in this time I was like, oh, it's must be some tasty blood, um, but it, <laughs> yeah, yuck. So uh, as we as we wind down because we're running out of time a little bit, I want to know uh, our usual question. We wrap things up. Who is your MVP of this episode? And Amy, I want to start with you on this one. Who is your MVP? Oh, MVP. Um, I would say, I think. Oh gosh, that's a hard one. There's so many. I think. Well, I'm just gonna say. Oh, I'm gonna say Allison. Alicent stepped up her game. We saw her, you know, awaken. Oh, I'm a queen, you know, and um, she's 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 someone now. She's she's a force to be reckoned with, and uh, she she showed up, and she's she looked damn good doing it. So that's my answer. I think that is an excellent MVP choice. She definitely uh, acquitted herself quite well in a way that we haven't seen her do before. So yeah, it was very nice to see. Uh, Mikey, what about you? Who is your MVP for this episode? The correct answer is Allison. The runner-up is Corliss. But you're not going to believe this. I have the same MVP as last week. Literally everybody besides Sir Kristen Cole. Besides <laughs> <laughs> Sir Kristen Cole. Yeah, I can't believe it. Two weeks in a row. Unbelievable. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's. I think that's going to be your, your answer for the remaining episodes of the season. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess for my MVP, I'm going to have to go with uh, Corliss Valerian because... Uh, it was just nice to see him make such a power play that's going to have, I think, really intense consequences as the season unfolds. Obviously, you know, we get a lot of character development for Alicent. You know, we get a lot of uh, movement for all these other characters. But I think that Corliss, he, he plays his hand and it pays off in spades. And I think that it's really going to be fascinating to see the repercussions of this deal play out uh, as the rest of the season continues to unfold. And I just love seeing more of House Valerian. I love seeing Driftmark. I love seeing a different aspect of Westeros. So it was just nice to see. Um, but yeah, that's it. Are there any other parting thoughts, anything we wanted to talk about before we go? Anything else? There, um, I, I don't want to, you know, I'm desperate not to spoil things. I just say this. The show is doing a really good job of giving you the characters that matter. So if you're watching and this is the story's entirely new to you and you know one of the, the fun things about Game of Thrones was that you got so much on a rewatch, you know like if you rewatched it one little line that you heard five times, it was on the sixth viewing where all of a sudden it made sense and it explained so much. I would just say if you're going to rewatch this, just pay attention to every character that they give a chance to to talk to. I'm not saying all of them will be important but a lot of them are going to be very, very important and it'll pay off to invest in them now. Nothing like a show that rewards you for overthinking and rewatching repeatedly. That's our bread and butter. Um, folks, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, everyone else, it's time to wrap things up. And unlike Joffrey, you can look forward to another breakdown of House of the Dragon next week right here. But if you want to dive deeper into this episode, in the meantime, we've got you covered over on Nerdist.com. With that said, thank you again to my amazing guests. Amy, where can people find you on the World Wide Web? Well, they can find me at Sword on Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And uh, Mikey, where can people find you? 
anyone has questions or just wants to get in on this Kristen Cole hate with me, you can find me on Twitter at Burger Mike. And you can also read me explaining why Sir Kristen Cole is the worst or all about the Grand Maester Conspiracy <laughs> at the greatest website anybody ever invented, the one that lets me write about this show, Nerdist.com. All right, folks. Well, thank you again so much. Thank you to everybody for tuning in. And in the meantime, folks, tell us, what did you think of this episode? What was your favorite moment? Let us know in the comments below. And for the latest and greatest in the world of pop culture, make sure you stay tuned to Nerdist.com.